just before we start, and I'll introduce our um, uh, our panelists today. Um, if you have any any questions for Michelle and Smaragda, can you please pop them in the Q and A box? Um, Kath, our campaign coordinator, will moderate the questions and we will try to get to most of them. Um, but if there are any outstanding questions, we always try and answer them uh, by email after the webinar. Um, also, if you want to see all the comments in the chat box from everybody else, from the panelists and from the at attendees, then please just change your setting to all panelists and attendees. Um, and then you can see all the, the comments that are being made in the chat box as well. Um, we normally aim for about 45 minutes, but it may take a little longer. So, yeah, so it's Smaragda and uh, Michelle, a warm welcome. Uh, maybe you can both unmute your, um, Smaragda, can you unmute your mic? Yay. There you go. Um, <laughs> we have Michelle Pickover from the EMS Foundation with us this afternoon and Smarak Delau from Ban Animal Trading. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining us today. Um, we will be unpacking a very interesting report, the Breaking Point reports uh, from the Extinction Business Series um, by these two ladies. Um, and I think before we start, Kath, did you set up the polling question? Um, whether, just a quick polling, whether or not you've actually read the report or know about the report. Um, so yeah, if you want to do that, just very quickly, just say, have you read it? Yes, no, or, but I will read it after this. And <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that will be the case for most people. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's just um, quite a frightening report. Um, so let's just start. Um, your report, The Breaking Point, focuses pretty much on South Africa's legal trade in live wild animals and this particular report to China. Um, so in my opinion, trade in live animals is so much often overlooked by people, um, by critics, you know, so often we're talking about um, trophy hunting and we're talking about lion bone trade, for example, if we're talking specifically about lions, but the life export in, in my view is often overlooked. What was your rationale for focusing specifically on life trade for this report? Um, Miss, you want to go? I'll chip in first, maybe, um, if that's okay. Or do you want to go, Max? You go. No, 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 go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm back <laughs> for you. <laughs> um, I think one of the one of the issues is that um, everyone thinks, and there's a lot of money being thrown at the so-called illegal trade, with the assumption that the legal trade in wild animals is well regulated and under control. And since both EMS and BAT work um, to protect um, wild animals, it soon became very evident to us that it's actually the legal trade that must be tackled, not only because of the loopholes, because it, but also because it la they launder animals through the legal trade. And really there's virtually nothing being written up about the legal trade um, and the extent of it, and um, as a critique of CITES as well. I'll stop there. Yeah, no, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's also for us, for ban animal trading, I mean, we're against the trading, um, you know, in all animals. So this really made sense. Um, and yes, basically, you know, what Michelle said, I mean, nobody really writes anything or very little is written about the legal trade because everybody just assumes that it's fine. You know, the animals go to good places, the government's got it under control, which is not the case at all. So, and I think, and I think um, also people think that CITES is there to protect animals um, and that the regulatory framework 
um, is, is, it doesn't have any real flaws in it. But the more you unpack it, the more you actually see how the system doesn't work, the, the more you understand that um, there isn't proper verification, traceability, um, you know, there's not proper compliance and, and, and very little enforcement. And it's a toxic mix. So if, if the legal trade isn't legal <laughs> and it has all these loopholes, then um, it needs to be banned. Because if they can't control the legal trade, then one can just imagine what is happening in the illegal trade. And with the legal trade being banned, it will be much easier to police the illegal trade. Yeah. yeah, I think it's difficult to understand really what the point of CITES is, you know, because they're definitely not there to protect animals. That's that's for sure. They're there mm. to kind of, you know, promote the trade in animals. And they, you know, they say, okay, now we're going to uplist these, uh, this specific species and they're now going to be CITES 1. But then if you register your breeding facility, like for example, the African gray parrots, if you register your breeding facility, um, with the, uh, you know, the management authority in, in South Africa and with CITES, then you can actually export the parrots as commercial, um, on a commercial basis, and then they become kind of CITES appendix two animals. You know, it's, it's just, the, it almost seems as if there's no point in all of this. What's the point of having um, animals listed on CITES appendix one? And in South Africa, surely nobody really cares whether animals are listed on uh, appendix one, uh, CITES appendix one or two. Um, if we look at the chimp, you know, you've got that picture up. If we look at the chimp exports, um, the tiger exports, nobody really cares what, you yeah. know, whether animals are CITES one or two or whether they are on CITES at all. It makes no difference in South Africa. Yeah, I would love to come back to that because I think there are so many loopholes from a CITES point of view. Um, if I can just, sort of come back first of all to some of the, the basics because I think um, some of those basics might uh, surprise people uh, what you found so for example in the breaking point you actually state that South Africa is the largest exporter of live wild animals to Asia um, so the largest exporter in Africa so what, what kind of quantity are we thinking, are we talking about? For example, how many live animals were exported to China? I think you were looking at sort of the period between 2016 and 19, roughly, wasn't it? So can you give us an idea of, of numbers and, and what species are we talking about? So people get a, a bit of a feel for, for the, the, the size of this legal trade for this, this industry. You know, um, Louise, that's quite a difficult question to answer. And the mm. reason for that is because the wildlife trade happens in a very secretive way, actually. It's very difficult to get full information on the extent of this trade. Mm. But we've done a lot of research, we've put in pie applications, we've done a lot of work, got a lot of different sources. And, you know, we found for that period that there were, I think it was 5,035, if I remember, um, yeah. animals that were sent to China during that period. But of course, that's just, it's, it's, it's not the, the full extent. And the reason why it's not the full extent is because we don't have information on the full extent. But it does give us a very good idea of, the kind of trade, what's involved, all the loopholes, and some of the species that are traded and where they go to. Yeah, and, and five thousand, and that's just to China. Yes, just and it, you know, I think also that's not. I think the numbers we have are the ones that you know we manage to find, that we manage to get the pie information on, or you know whatever. There must be so many more. I mean, I wouldn't even. I, I would think that there's like ten thousand, fifty. 15,000, 20,000. I mean, we don't really know. But the mm. 5,000, you know, we were able to kind of look at what is going on and we could identify some certain patterns of things that are going on. Um, and one of the issues that really came to the fore, and um, I feel really strongly about this, and Nietzsche said, is that the traders involved um, in the trading of live wild animals don't want to be identified. 
um, which we have found with all three, um, the reports that we've put out so far, the traders want to remain, you know, in the shadows. Yet if there are traders in, um, I was actually saying to Michelle yesterday, you know, if somebody, like say, for example, you're selling, I don't know, caravans, right? And you make a deal with um, a company in Belgium, you can going splash it all over. And tell everybody, you know, this is how everything is working and we're branching out and everything is fantastic and we're making so much money and the company is really doing well. Except when it comes to wild animals, the people hide. They don't want to be identified as wildlife traders. And that's one thing that came across throughout. And even the one that we're busy working on now, the Bangladesh one, is exactly the same. People are going to freak out because they don't want to be named. When why? What's the reason? And but is I'm that, sure. when you say people don't want to be identified, is that both... Um, on the exporting side as well as the importing side? No, I think mostly what we are aware of is, you know, from South Africa. So the, yeah. um, the exporters don't want to be identified. And obviously, you know, we know of a few people, um, if we look at China specifically, that were upset that their names were mentioned. But, you know, why? Mm. I mean, it doesn't really make any difference. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things as well is that people kind of spin who they are. And so, I mean, you know, it's, it's a given fact that zoos are a big problem and a major loophole in the international trade. And anybody can set up a zoo. I think you pay a couple of hundred rand and boom, bang, you know, you get your permit and you have a zoo. And, um, and people then also ask for donations and that kind of thing. Um, but behind that sanctuary or that zoo, um, is essentially just trade, breeding and trade, whether it's trade locally or trade overseas, or the people that they sell to locally then sell those animals on overseas. So it really is a bit of a, a, a it's a facade. And, um, you know, people don't, don't want themselves, other people to know that their business is really trading in animals. Yes. And you know what I would love to know is how much all these private zoos um, in South Africa have contributed to conservation, you know, which is what they always say. Oh, we contribute to conservation. I wonder what the contribution has been. Um, as for education, you know, they bus in little children all the time. And we know, we've seen, I mean, there's lots of research that shows that kiddies, you know, kind of spend maybe 90 seconds at a zoo enclosure before they move on. So there's really no educational value. But the, 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 the local private zoos are simply there to breed and trade. That's all they're there for. Yeah. And when, once we export and, and, and we know that there's um, trades from South Africa is certainly done under the guise, as you just said as well, of conservation and education. Um, so we've just... Uh, you, you just mentioned breeding as well. So were these animals, are they mostly imported on the other side by zoos? Um, or are they also imported by breeding farms or even laboratories for, 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 for you know, um, whatever kind of um, uh, things they do with, with the animals um, in those places and in terms of vivisection or what, whatever it is. What, what, what is it that you have actually identified when you were looking? Because I know, Smarakta, you also went to China. You actually checked up on a lot of the addresses to see um, what the importers were in reality. Yes, yes, absolutely. Look, I, you know, the animals go to zoos, they go to um, brokers, um, and they go to labs. And um, I think if we look at the numbers of animals, probably the majority of animals would have gone to um, laboratories, if I'm not mistaken. You know, the biggest number, and that would have been, all of them would have been Mama Z monkeys. Um, they would have gone to the laboratories. But the, the reason for that is that, you know, China is, um, that's one, shall we call it an industry, of a section that they are pushing. And, um, you know, they are setting up breeding um, colonies for monkeys and so on, especially for marmosets. And actually China is one of the biggest exporters of primates to the US for vivisection. So yes, you know, they keep on, um, they keep on importing them from South Africa. And you know, I mean, 
how do you breed monkeys? You're a breeder and you say you love them so much because that's what everybody says, right? They love them so much. And then you actually, knowingly, you send them to a lab where you know they're going to be tortured. I, I don't get that, but anyway. Yeah, I, I, there's a, I think this, this kind of adds to what you were just talking about, a, a, a question from uh, Stephanie Evers. Do you think zoos are deeply involved? They're notorious for keeping everything secret. And I think you've partly answered that question already. Um, zoos are a very considerable part of this life trade, right? Absolutely. There's yeah. no question about it. Yeah, definitely. Especially the private zoos, eh, Mish? Yeah, but I think, I mean, you know, obviously people who trade, they, they, they also use those animals locally as either for interaction or, you know, people to visit the place. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, I think Definitely, you know, zoos are so implicated. Um, and I think we should shut all zoos, apart from the fact that they are colonial constructs, they should not exist. And in a country like South Africa, we should be getting rid of zoos precisely for that reason, over and above the fact that they, they um, are, are not properly regulated, that they are part of the wildlife trade and are used to launder animals. Um, you know, we, we need to shut them down. End of story. Actually, that, um, if I can ask another question from Robert Smith here, um, I think that um, because you, you just said they're just not well regulated or not regulated at all. Question, who regulates wildlife trade in South Africa? Is that wildlife department, agriculture, business se uh, sectors? Um, so, who is the regulator of this wild, this live wild animal trade in South Africa? Well, that would be the Department of Environmental, uh, of Environment, Fisheries and Forestry, right? They're the, they're the overall um, kind of department. Um, the National Department is, has to oversee what happens in all the provincial departments, which initially they said, no, it wasn't true. They always said, they always, they always told us uh, the department, uh, national departments in the, oh, sorry, the uh, nature conservation departments in the provinces are, you know, they do their own thing. They don't have to report back to the national province, nothing uh, to the national department. Everything is just, you know, they just do their own thing, which is not true. And the minister actually confirmed that uh, when we had a meeting with her saying that they are, you know, they're the authority and they should be uh, looking to see that everything in every province is actually done properly. Mm. Yeah, it's a very strange situation, isn't it, in South Africa, where they always uh, hide behind this 9-1 situation, the nine provinces and the national departments. Look, the bottom line is when it comes to CITES listed animals, at least, um, those CITES permits, every single one of them has the, the uh, national department stamp on it. So ultimately, mm. they are the ultimate authority. Um, but, you know, it also raises the issue of welfare because it's the Department of Environment and the Nature Conservation Departments that issue the permits, but nobody looks at the welfare issues um, because it's not their competency in terms of their own legislation. So um, that all just falls by the wayside um, and terrible things happen from a welfare perspective. We all know that. Um, and no one's really attending to it. It's left up to an under-resourced NGO. Yes. Yeah. And, and maybe, Kat, you can show some of the pictures um, because I, I did a quick tally of some of the cats um, that you reported on um, and you summarised the big cats that are uh, being exported, uh, have been exported in that period between 2016 and 19. So there were 182 lions, 20 cheetah, 159 caracals, 92 serval, 45 Bengal tigers, 14 black leopards and 12 pumas. And some of those images that 
are there. They just look like incredibly sad, depressed animals in, in my view. So welfare is, is an issue. Look, look at this picture of this lion just breaks my heart because it just shows an incredibly depressed animal that lies on some kind of wooden structure in a, in, in an, I don't know what kind of building it is. So welfare is an issue here, but welfare is even more of an issue probably on the other side when we're looking at countries like, like China. And Smaragda, would you, would you like to, to sort of tell us a little bit about what you've found when you were visiting some of these facilities that we export our iconic species to? Yeah, I think, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's a horrible, it's, it's terrible to walk around and, you know, see these animals in captivity in those places. I remember uh, going to one specific zoo, um, uh, I'll, the, uh, the name will come right now, um, but it's one of the zoos that we exported a hundred, no, almost 400, I can't remember the exact number now, but say over 450 giraffes to and then when I got there, there were 16 giraffes on the premises. There. And some of them were actually really young. And there's no way for us to know whether those giraffes came, you know, or were they the ones that came from South Africa. But it's so cold there. I mean, on the day that we went, it was minus 11. Um, the little, they'd imported also meerkats from South Africa. And the little meerkats were literally sitting there and they were shivering. You could see their little bodies shivering like that. Um, you know, most of the places are in total disrepair. Um, and there's no, nothing, nothing, nothing. There's not even, I don't even think they pretend to educate the people who come to the zoos because there's, there's nothing there that shows you, you know, who these animals are, where they came from, as if that matters, but still, you know, that would be some form of education. Um, and also, I think the fact is that once the animals have left South Africa and they go to these um, zoos, uh, there's no way to trace them. We don't yeah. know what happens to them after they've been exported from here, going to, for example, they say to one of these zoos. You know, it's, it's not only that they go to zoos, they also go to street markets. I mean, I found our um, bullfrogs in street markets in China. Um, there's just no, there's no regulation, there's no management, there's no control. They end up wherever people want them to be. And it's yeah. horrible to see them in these, um, in these, so, you know, the tiger lying on that, um, you know, on that bench there. Um, if I'm not mistaken, that's Tianjin Zoo. And the animals, because it's, you know, I, I, the, the temp they don't let the, the, they don't let the tigers out. They don't let the lions out. So they're basically in this room that has been painted and the paint is flaking off as you can see, um, where they stay for what, five, six months a year. Um, and we think this is okay. We believe that, yeah. you know, it's fine for us to send animals to places like that because um, the management authority or the authorities in China would have come back to the authorities here and they would have said, no, these facilities are wonderful and we believe them. Yeah, and one of my main... Louise, can I just come in there? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, sure. Our authorities, authorities, and I, you know, I had to absolutely hate using that word. Um, because they, they're not authorities in this particular instance. They don't check the addresses. They, they, they don't, it's not, in fact, it's not incumbent on them to do that. Um, it's literally just stamping, write out the permit, and it's handwritten. Sometimes it's typed, stamp, boom, they've done their job, you know. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the way things are, and we all know what's going on in the world right now, we, we, we actually facing a severe crisis, mm -hmm. something that is actually threatening the existence of Earth and humans as well. And we have to, we have to make our governments be more responsible. They have to behave in a more holistic way. They have to behave in a more ethical way. They have to behave in a more compassionate way. And they have to do their jobs properly. Yeah. 
yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, one of the things I just wanted to say, like those, those 45 Bengal tigers that we know of that were exported, you know, one of my concerns is that these animals are then either being bred with and those the offspring get slaughtered um, for their bones and body parts for a very thriving um, traditional Chinese medicine market, or the actual live animals are, are being slaughtered on arrival for that very reason. So have you been able to trace any of these tigers? Have you find, found evidence that that happens? We weren't able to, you know, it's very difficult to be quite honest yeah. with you. It's really difficult for somebody from South Africa to go to China, Vietnam, places like that and try and track the animals, you know, to see where they go from one place to another. And I don't think that that is, you know, where we can make the difference. The difference uh, where we can make a difference is here. So it's really yeah. important for us to go and check the facilities and to show people, you know, this is what our government in South Africa um, thinks is okay. You know, this is, they approve of all of this. Um, but to actually track the animals in, a diff in other countries is very, very, very difficult. Um, you know, I'm thinking of, for example, sorry, I've got Bangladesh on my mind because we're kind of working on that right now. And I'm thinking, you know, we've sent like, thousands of birds to Bangladesh, thousands. And there's no way, you know, where we would even know where to start finding them. And most of the addresses are um, fake addresses anyway. I mean, oh. some of the animals that we send to Bangladesh, lions have gone to a freaking shoe shop. To a shoe shop. Yeah. Yeah. And, and under societies, the exporting countries, so South Africa in this case, they're not even obliged to verify whether or not the address is le legitimate, right? No, no I think they're, no. they're not supposed to. I mean, I mean, there are two things. One is that um, we must remember that all, every, all, the, all of these countries that are member countries of CITES, every couple of years they all go in their suits or whatever and off they go to the societies meeting and they discuss this resolution and that resolution but the bottom line is that it's not mandatory to even implement those resolutions and often those resolutions relate to you know could be about acceptable destinations although that discussion goes on for years and it's never resolved but the bottom line is that they, they, they're not, it's not mandatory for them to implement those resolutions. The only thing that, it, that they have to do as a country that is signed on to CITES is to implement the actual text of the treaty itself, which is virtually nothing, you know. And, and going back to the tiger issue, you must remember that in South Africa, tigers are seen as exotic. So even when they do audits or you know, so-called inspections of these places, they don't even list the tigers or the tigons or the ligers or the crossbreeds because they're putting tigers and lions in the same enclosures. They're not including those, those individuals. Um, they fall completely outside of, of anything, any regulation whatsoever. Um, and, and yet they, we are sending live tigers to countries that have got a serious issue around the tiger born industry. Exactly. A serious, serious problem. Yet we are sending live tigers there. Yeah. And the, and the funny thing is, Mish, that the people sending, or the breeders or whatever, most of them um, are not registered with a management authority, and they're not registered with CITES as a breeding facility for CITES 1 appendix animals. And that's, a, you, that's one of the, you know, one of the main issues. You have to have that, um, that registration to be able to trade and to send these animals from zoo to zoo or to be able to trade them from appendix, you know, so that they change from appendix 1 to appendix 2. They have to be registered. But they're not. And I mean, we send tigers and lions, well, not lions, but we send tigers to individuals. We don't send them to, only to zoos, we send them to individuals. How's that even acceptable? Yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, no, carry on, please. No, I just wanted to take a couple of questions from um, people listening in here. Um, and, uh, you know, because. Uh, there's, there's so many angles and so many questions I think we all have and I think I, I would love to sort of go back to the whole CITES um, um, 
discussion because there is some really interesting bits to to unpack i think um but one megan carr has a question here saying are some wildlife breeders and traders masquerading as wildlife sanctuaries in south africa well i mean I, you know for, for sure because they would call themselves a zoo or a sanctuary right mm -hmm. Um, they would say they're sanctuary, and as I say, some of them have, you know, a sort of donate button, um, or they, they bring in volunteers um, who actually pay to work there. That to me is a bit of a bit of a scam, but you know, it's a business. It's not a it's 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 not a, a, a not for profit enterprise that's looking after the interests of those animals. Um, so yeah, for sure, um, that yeah. is the. Absolutely. I, I remember one specifically, um, it's Farm Inn in Pretoria, um, that says they've got these big signboards outside saying, you know, this is a sanctuary for lions and so on. And we know that they trade, I mean, we've got the proof that they actually trade in lions. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, they also trade in caracal. I must actually check. But they don't only trade in lions. Um, but that's, you know, that's supposed to be a sanctuary. And one of the zoos, um, you know, that... I remember we saw that, that one, one of the zoos was Mystic Monkeys and Feathers. Um, they described themselves as a sanctuary as well. Um, and then when we pointed out that that's actually not a sanctuary, they changed that. So it's not, it's no longer on the website page. Right. Yeah. Just to, to remind everybody listening in, you know, a sanctuary, a proper true sanctuary would never breed they would not trade, um, they will not allow any interaction with the animals and they provide forever home. So that is kind of the, the full golden rules, if you like, for a, a true sanctuary. Um, so just to, to remind people um, what, a, what a sanctuary is. Um, so uh, another question here, Again from Stephanie Evers, the lion exports, are they taken from the wild or from many breeders? No, they come from breeders. Um, well, that's what we, you know, they, nobody really checks. I mean, so, you know, we wouldn't know whether the, uh, they say, they'll say on the permit, you know, they're captive bred or whatever. But one of the issues that we picked up is that nobody checks whether these animals are act, actually captive bred or um, wild caught. Yeah. And how would they know? I mean, they wouldn't know. So, I mean, I think often with with people who breed, they need to get in the genetics from the wild animals because they, they're so much into breeding. And so they would rescue a wild animal and then use that wild animal to breed. I, I guess that's what happens. Mm. I think you're absolutely right, Michelle. And, uh, I was uh, just before lockdown. I was in in one of the facilities up north, and um, <clears throat> there was an enclosure with probably over thirty around one year old lions and tigers, all mixed up. Um, they were all around that similar sort of age, and one lion was all on its own and was just so scared, was hissing and growling at um, everybody, people, but also the other animals. And the guide actually made a bit of a slip of, of, of the tongue. And he said, oh yeah, that's a wild lion. Um, and I'm sure they bring in, you know, however obtains, they do bring in wild lions, um, even if it is just, as you say, for genetics, to bring in some fresh genetic material. Um, I think there's also a question here with regards, and, and, and maybe I, I'm very happy to, uh, to answer this one because it's more about tourism. As one of the drivers, how much do you think to, the tourism industry can play a role in helping end the wildlife trade within and out of South Africa? I don't know whether you would like to answer it. Otherwise, I'm very happy to well, comment on that. Right. Yeah, but, but I think, I mean, the bottom line is that the worst thing for South Africa's tourism is actually the captive breeding and trading in animals because 
our reputation as a country, as a destination, is, is, is very poor as a consequence. So getting rid of the, the industry, um, I think, would actually bolster our tourism and improve our image overseas. I mean, people have got other countries to go to, better places to go to, where we're actually not farming animals um, to sell or, 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 or turn into bones. Yes, I, I agree with you, uh, Michelle. Um, and I think also tourism can play a very important role to um, a sustainable tourism or ecotourism or whatever you want to call it can play a very important role to create an alternative, um, to create jobs, to create a lot more jobs um, and, and higher quality type of jobs. So I think tourism can play a really very positive, important role um, and uh, I, I agree that the, the industry itself um, damages our, our actual um, tourism reputation. Um, well, there's another, um, another question with regards to tourism. Can you explain the interaction component further? I'm aware that this is with the public volunteers. Does this also include the sanctuary staff? If the other components are present, that is nil breeding or trading. Oh, I think I know exactly what Bernie is trying to say. The no interaction for for um, sanctuaries. Um, yes, staff should also not interact with the animals. Only if it's absolutely essential from a veterinary point of view. Um, so yes, the no interaction does also apply to sanctuary. Um, sorry, I was reading that and thought, oh, I don't, but I know exactly what she meant. Um, I think there's a question, well, it's more it's, it's something on, on giraffes. And I hmm. think that's an important point to make, actually, that the giraffes, and we're sending hundreds of giraffes um, to captivity, all come from the wild. So, you know, um, how, you know, and... Uh, I think for a giraffe, that must be absolute hell on earth. Hell yeah. on earth. And giraffe, the numbers are plummeting. So if we're just taking them out of the wild as well, and, and as this, uh, let me just see, uh, Julika, I think Kenaway, um, as she's saying as well, um, that many actually die en route um, and I think that applies for quite a few of animals that we are exporting live. Have you, have you found any evidence, any information that many of these live animals actually die en route? Well, I think there was, you know, it's very often um, that we find information in the media of the country where the animals are going to, uh, with the country that is importing them. So, for example, the giraffes. Uh, we sent out 15 giraffes, I think it was last year or the year before, I can't remember exactly, and they went to Pakistan, and um, if I'm not mistaken, all of them died. All of um, them. All of them, yeah. And we've also sent out a huge number of uh, different species of wild animals to India, and um, I found a, um, uh, an article um, saying that I think about three quarters of those animals have died. Uh, so yes, you know, um, giraffes we know are very, very sensitive. Um, but yes, that's the, you know, the, um, but that's one issue that is even more secret, you know, than the permits that are issued is how many animals die because nobody's going to give us that information. Yeah. Um, but also I think with some of the consignments, I mean, they're not going to check in the box what's in there. You know, if you're sending out a live lion, um, you know, who, who's actually going to check what's in that box? I mean, there could be other illegal material going out. There could be other animals, for example, with the birds. You know, they're sending out, you know, hundreds of birds at a time, sometimes thousands. So who's actually going to check what birds they are and how many they're actually sending out? Yes, especially with those sort of numbers. 
this? Who's going to count them? Can't count. It's impossible to count them. And you know, I mean, I'm thinking of snakes. You know, they go in these, they put them in these little bags, and then they hang them mm. in these places. I mean, who's going to check snakes? So nobody yeah. really knows, you know, who's inside, and where they're going, and are they supposed to be going to where the permit says or where the label says? You know, it's very, very difficult. It is. It is. There's um, um, a question, and I don't know whether you you are aware of it. What is going on with baby elephants that were um, exported from Zim um, in 2019? And I think it's also sort of started just before the CITES, uh, the last CITES conference. Um, and Graham is actually asking, did CITES try to prevent this? Um, did they allow it, or did it take did it uh, take place? Did these baby elephants actually were they exported? Yeah, they were exported. CITES didn't yeah. try and stop it at all. No, it's legal within CITES. Um, so, if, for example, in South Africa, it's not legal because you're not mm. allowed to send um, elephants overseas unless it's for in situ conservation. Um, and that's because, you know, we, we have the norms and standards for elephants. But Zimbabwe doesn't have that. And that's why, you know, I mean, people say scientists isn't fit for purpose. It's, it's, it's totally fit for purpose because it's a trade organization. It's yes. a trade treaty. Um, and that's why it's got to go. Mm. I think that brings us back very nicely to a couple of questions I have about CITES. Um, and Smaragda, you actually sort of um, said something about that very early on in the conversation. So Appendix 1 listed animals may only be traded as Appendix 2 listed animals if they're captive bred. Um, in a facility registered with CITES um, and the trade is for non-commercial purposes. Now um, also I think compliance for non-commercial purposes means that animals cannot be sold to a third party after import. So there's actually a lot to unpack in that statement. Um, did you find breeders of Appendix 1 species like leopard and tiger in South Africa that are registered with CITES? No, not a single one. Not a single one. No. No, not for tigers, definitely not. No, not, not one. And also not for um, chimpanzees. Actually, no. So I'm not sure how the provincial authorities can actually be issuing the permits. Yeah. Yeah, because I've also been just, sorry, yeah, go for it, Smish. No, just to just to to raise another problem is that you see CITES doesn't define what a zoo is, but mm -hmm. they assume there's this kind of assumption that if it's Z for zoo, it's non-commercial. Yeah. And that is a serious, serious flaw because a lot of the zoos, most of the zoos are commercial entities. Gone are the days of, you know, colonial zoos that swapped this animal for that animal. This is a big, big industry and it's all commercial. Um, so to actually say, it, well, it was for non-commercial purposes because it was a zoo, that, that's completely, it's, it's, it's wrong. Something needs to happen dramatically to change this. You actually answered my second question because that was exactly what I was going to ask, you know, the non-commercial purposes. Um, so a for-profit zoo is still classed as a non-commercial purpose. Mm -hmm. Trophy hunting is still classed as a non-commercial purpose under CITES. Um, and then did you find, because uh, I believe you have sort of tried and looked into this, but did you find animals that were retraded to your third party after import? Uh, no, I, you know, the, uh, we didn't actually, I think our um, kind of focus was to go and see where the animals we are exporting from South Africa are going to in China and are those addresses, well not only China but generally, 
Um, are those addresses legitimate? Is there a business? Um, you know, and that was really what our focus was. And for mm -hmm. us to trace an animal from, no, but hang on a second. You know what? Um, this was, this was a, a CITES 2, this was a CITES 2 listed one. For example, we found um, crocodiles, right? Um, when we did the reptile report, crocodiles going from here to Japan, and then from Japan, they go to another country, not stipulated. It was a Facebook post. You know, this is another way of getting the information. Um, it was a Facebook post from that specific zoo saying, oh, we got him from South Africa and he looked terrible. And now we fattened him up and now he's going to some, I don't know, zoo in, in Europe. So, you know, these animals, like literally, they, they just go from one place to another. Nobody can trace them. Nobody knows where they are. Are people eating them? Are they being killed? Are they actually arriving at the zoo? Nobody knows anything. Yeah. You know, I think because a lot of the addresses were, either they were fake or they were like a little office or a hotel or something weird. It's clearly obvious that the animals were not there. So they were sold on, obviously, to somewhere else. Um, or that was just, and that, that in terms of societies isn't supposed to be allowed. Um, but who's checking? You know, scientists doesn't have anybody in their office verifying anything. So who, you know, they don't verify, they don't look at the permits that are issued by scientists management authorities in the import and export countries. So it's a free for all. It's really yeah. quite a joke. It's one of the worst systems I've ever come across. I think that's part of the problem, isn't it? They create this, this, this system that looks all very accomplished um, with all these rules. Uh, but then on steroids and it's just, because <laughs> all they're doing is they're shuffling paper. That's all they're doing. <laughs> but yeah, it's so difficult to enforce and to follow, even to just follow animals being where they come from, where they go to, where they end up ultimately, I think that whole trail is just so incredibly difficult to follow. You know, and especially in countries um, which are difficult to navigate, like Pakistan, Bangladesh, those are difficult countries. Um, mm. uh, because, you know, we, we know animal smuggling in Bangladesh is, you know, it's just one of the, one of the countries where that, I mean, that's kind of what happens to most of the animals who are exported to Bangladesh. Um, and it's difficult to navigate your way around there if you are, you know, a foreigner. Um, and so for us to track the animals there is really, really difficult. I mean, we didn't really set out to do that. We just needed to verify whether this address, I mean, does it exist? Is it an office? Um, is it a zoo? Uh, you know, what kind of a place is it? Um, mm. And is it a house? And that's basically it. And, you know, once they go to the brokers, I mean, the brokers could be selling them to anybody. So. Yeah. Can I, can I bring one last question to the table? Because I know that this report actually, you, you created a bit of a stir um, because you submitted this report to our Minister of Environment, um, Barbara Creasy, right? And she uh, initiated a meeting with yourselves. Um, because she actually, if I'm not mistaken, she acknowledged that civil society has a role to play in holding government to account and therefore government should be transparent. Um, and she actually promised to investigate some of the issues that you highlighted in, in your reports. Um, but this is, this is, must be more than three months ago. Um, have you heard anything? What has been the outcome? Has there been an investigation? No. no. Well, we don't know if there has been or there hasn't been. What we did ask for was an independent investigation because having the department investigate the department really makes no sense whatsoever. Um, and so and it's, it's not just the department. It's actually compliance and enforcement because the issues we raise are really in relation to compliance and enforcement. And so there's no way, in our view, um, that the, the enforcement and compliance departments can investigate themselves. So she had told us three months, um, and that was, when was that? 22nd, 22nd. Yeah. Let's, let's make it the 23rd, okay? Let's make it the 23rd. 
give her a day. So now we had four months already, not a word. Nobody has got, well, they tried to get, you know, we said, if there is an independent investigator, we are happy to share our information with the independent investigator. But uh, nobody's, nobody contacted us, so, yeah. No. So you don't actually know whether anything has happened. Um, there's been no, no feedback so far. You no, know, I mean, I, I, I don't know, call me cynical, you know, but we've, we've asked for investigations before on other issues and um, the investigations have, have not been very good, um, are pretty flawed. I, I, I don't know what's actually happening with this, but we haven't been contacted by mm -hmm. anybody doing an investigation. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm assuming there's been no independent investigation because I'm sure they would have wanted to speak to us. Absolutely, I agree with you 100%, definitely. Yeah, they would have at least asked for the evidence that um, you based your findings on, right? Um, yeah. Is there anything else that you would like to, to add to the discussion? I think it's been really interesting. Um, I've, I've tried to sort of bring in some of the questions from, from the attendees as well. So if I've missed out your question, then please um, don't hate me. It's sometimes very difficult to, to kind of, when there is a flow of discussion going to add those in. Um, but I don't know, is there anything else that you would like to add? Otherwise, um... I see there's a question from some, some Trevor Uttel or something. Happy to answer that question. What I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's an attack on us. It would always be. It would if if it comes from yeah. him. Um, we had I had an attack from him yesterday on live export. So I assume yeah, it would be. I I can't see the question, but go for it, Mitch. No, I also I'm not. What is the basis of the question, Louise? Um, okay, he's asking animal rights organizations such as you often make claims of traders, breeders, hunters and any other pro sustainable use industry role players as just being in it for the money and exploiters of animals. How do you justify your exploitation of not only animals but also the public for donations? And with your constant calls for donations, how do you see this as being different from pro use groups? You know, I really, I have to laugh every time somebody says about the donations. Now, Trevor, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to answer you directly. And I hope I, you're, you know, we, we're facing one another. The fact of the matter is, can you please direct me to where all the millions are, number one? And number two, can you please show me on the ban animal trading page where we have asked for money? Please do that. And then we can take it from there. You know, some people do things and they work for issues because they have values and they are passionate about what they do. They're not like hunters and traders who are only in it for the money. And that's the difference. And you need to learn and understand that there's a difference between these two groups of people. He's actually saying thanks, Max. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies. I think we're running out of time. We've nearly, yeah, we've been chatting for 50, 55 minutes. Um, I think this has been really, really interesting. I hope that everybody has enjoyed um, the discussion as much as I did. Um, thank you so much. And we will be uploading the, um, the recording to our YouTube channel. Um, if you want to help, there's lots of different ways. I'm not going to go through this too, too much. Um, the one thing I would like to ask, um, if anybody hasn't done so far, we are still running our 800 Lions campaign um, and we are still looking for people who want to submit line art that we want to bring to our minister. Um, we're looking for 800 pieces of art because they are representing the 800 lions that um, in the past were uh, the, the lion bone quota. So anybody who hasn't done so far, you don't have to be a, a, a great artist. Um, anything goes. 
just put your heart and soul into it. That's all we're asking for. And then also the, the yeah, the deadline for the lion pictures is actually the 23rd of October. So we've still got a little bit of time, about three weeks. Um, so um, there's still some time to actually uh, uh, submit those that art through our websites. And, um, and then I just want to let people know that hopefully um, we are going to be having another um, webinar on the 22nd of October uh, with Richard Pierce, who should by then have um, had his uh, Lions, Bones and Bullets uh, documentary finished. So that will be a very, another very interesting conversation to have. Thank you all so much. Um, and I have put in a link where you can find the report, um, the breaking point report. I've put the link in a little bit early into the chat group. But what we'll do is we will email everybody with that link to the report as well. So you can download it and maybe we can put in your, um, your reptile report as well. Um, that you have done since. So we will email that to everybody um, uh, if, if you want to go back and read it. Thank you both so much, Smaragdam and Michelle, and I wish everybody a very good evening. <laughs>